The, the World Breastfeeding Week is celebrated within the first seven days in the month of August, a yearly global campaign that aims to increase awareness on the health and well-being of infants, young children, mothers, families, and the society at large. Now, this initiative is geared towards generating awareness and encouraging support for exclusive breastfeeding of a child for the first six months of life. Now, according to the World Health Organization, more than half a billion women uh, or working women are not given essential maternity protections in national laws, and fewer than half of infants under six months of age are exclusively breastfed. Now, the global theme for this year's World Breastfeeding Week is enabling breastfeeding, making a difference for working parents because of the pressure that comes with uh, combining work and breastfeeding. Now, aside the bond between the mother and child, you know, adjoining breastfeeding, breast milk provides a baby with ideal nutrition and supports growth and development. This year's advocacy is for workplaces to be made conducive and encourage breastfeeding. That's the crux of our talk next. And joining us via Zoom is consultant public health physician, Association of Public Health Physicians of Nigeria, Dr. Oluwatoni Adeyemi. It's nice to have you join us here on the program. Good morning. Thank you for having me. Great. And here in the studio, we have uh, Olubukola Olawi, a pediatric nurse and uh, breastfeeding advocate. It's nice to have you join us. Yes. We're here again yes. with, with our little baby. baby. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Now, let, let us start this way. And, and let me start, with, start from the studio, uh, Bukola. The, the workplace, women are getting more involved. We're seeing women more visible in the workplace because of um, you know, the trends in the society are giving more place to women and they're getting more involved. Of course, the woman has to remain a woman to be able to, uh, so the concept of having babies will continue. But how are workplaces modifying the issues of work around policies, around a conducive environment for mothers and women who are becoming more prominent in the workplace to navigate with children and breastfeed them properly. What are you seeing so far? Okay, thank you very much. <clears throat> the policy we have around them breastfeeding now <clears throat> is still um, 16 weeks maternity leave. And we're just even talking about those people in the public sector sectors. Mm. What about those people that are not in the public sectors? So we are talking about the formal and informal sectors. We still have our mothers in the market. They go to their farms. So what arrangement is in place for these people? So now it's only those people in public sectors that have the benefit of 16 weeks and only few states. 16 weeks amounts to four months. About four months. Four months, okay. Maternity leave All right. leave. And Few states like Lagos State, Kaduna State, mm. and I think um, in Oikiti mm. are now giving six months to mothers and also paternity leave 14 working days to father. Mm. So we are advocating that even mothers in the market, in the marketplace, that they, are should, they should make the environment conducive for them to maybe they should and have an idea place that they, just a room that can call like um, a center where all this baby can be kept, and the mothers will also go there. Something like a crutch. Okay. And in the former sectors, we can we should make the um, the uh, uh, environment conducive for these people to prepare a place for them and allow them to have access to their baby whenever they want to visit them. Okay. All right. Uh, let me put you on hold, uh, Mrs. Olawi, and um, you know get the views of uh, Dr. Ade Yeni. Uh, our studio guest raised a, a very vital and interesting point, and that's the issue of um, you know the the informal sector because you know in line with the theme, you know making breastfeeding and work work. So you know how how do we bring in or bring on board those in the informal sector who work you know and you know who make up a majority of uh, of those who even work in in nigeria in order to make this um, agenda of mass breastfeeding count in nigeria 
All right, thank you very much for that question. So yes, that's a very um, germane question because as you've rightly said, a great percentage of our population actually consists of this informal sector. And when we are coming up with policies, we need to include them. It has to be an inclusive policy to ensure that it benefits them as well. So first of all, I think that the awareness has actually dropped on um, breastfeeding, the benefits to the mother, the benefits to the child, the benefits to the community. So first of all, I believe that we have to create awareness. We have to um, educate some of these women. We have to reignite the passion for wanting to breastfeed their babies because this has significantly um, reduced. Our exclusive breastfeeding rate has actually come down. We are nowhere near the global target currently. I think less than 30 percent of babies are currently being exclusively breastfed and some of those barriers that have already been identified are contributing towards this. So once we increase that awareness and inform them of the advantages of breastfeeding, they also will be collaborative partners and want to make this work. And once we get them as collaborative partners, then we need to ensure that we have all the right structures in place to ensure that they have spaces for breastfeeding. There's also self-stigma that has been associated with people, women breastfeeding in public. So this awareness is also going to reduce some of the stigma that some of these women face when they have to bring out their breasts and breastfeed their children because they feel that society might actually frown at them. So we need to um, ensure that they are well aware, they are educated, even the community around, because we need community support. Apart from family support, we need community support to ensure that women in the informal sector are able to breastfeed at will. Then government also has a role to play, as rightly said by the studio guest. If there are no provisions made for paid maternity leave for those in the formal sector. We should have social support systems whereby when this woman cannot work because they are at home breastfeeding their children or their babies, there's a stipend or there's something that is paid to them or there's a form of support that the society and government gives. So I think for now, I'll just rest my case here and say that the informal sector is a major factor that contributes to ensuring that we have higher exclusive breastfeeding rates. All right, let, let me come to the studio, Dr. Lawi. The, the, the point there is, the moment we talk about work, right, we're looking at the family now uh, where the father is also involved. And that space where we're talking about the baby and so on, speak to us from the window of what, fa what roles fathers are supposed to play in support, because that is also very critical from what I understand. Father have a critical role to play. Mm. It's also there to support the woman. And um, she is there to provide financial support for the woman so that the woman can eat very well. And also emotional support, encouragement from the man is very, very necessary and vital to successful breastfeeding. Mm. The man will also be available to work around the home so that it can be of help to the woman, so that the woman can also concentrate on breastfeeding the baby. Mm. So when you say work around the home, you're talking about chores and stuff? Yeah, also chores, okay. yeah. <laughs> yeah. And even to carry the baby, to help to carry the baby okay. occasionally, you know, cuddle the baby and care for both the mother and the child. Amazing. But it's very important that it provides good nutrition for the woman during that period uh, uh, and, I, and I think, beyond. Right, and I think that is also, you know, uh, very important, uh, you know, Dr. Adeyemi, the issue of, um, okay, yes, it's good to breastfeed, but then the quality of your milk and, um, you know, the, the nexus between the quality of your milk and, you know, the mental health of, um, of the mother, you know, you know, these are important factors that, um, you know, one shouldn't, um, shouldn't, you know, reduce the, the importance of, you know, help us speak in this, in this regard and how crucial support is uh, for the woman who is breastfeeding. Yeah, so um, thank you. So support is actually very important. Nutrition is very key because, as you rightly said, um, the breast milk is a product of what the woman eats, is a product of her adequate diet and nutrition. That's why um, poverty and socioeconomic factors have also been identified as a barrier to breastfeeding. You would wonder and think that if breastfeeding is um, fully uh, um, breastfeeding, you don't have to pay anything for breastfeeding, becomes it comes naturally, that how come 
women um, in poverty are still not able to exclusively breastfeed and they will prefer to actually go and buy some of those breast milk substitutes. Some of them, poverty contributes in the fact that they are not able to eat an adequate diet. And if they're not able to eat an adequate diet, they don't lactate well enough. So the breast milk is not coming out well, first of all, and then the quality of the breast milk also is reduced such that when the child breastfeeds, the child keeps crying and the notion of the mother or um, even uh, people around that are helping take care of this child, the notion they have is that the child is not getting adequate milk, go and buy extra milk, go and buy formula, go and buy breast milk substitute. But this is a function of inadequate nutrition. So when women come and complain, complain that they're not lactating well enough, we advise them to eat well, eat mm. foods that are rich in fruits, in vegetables, and ensure that they have rich and an Good adequate diet. diet. All right, we, we can't overemphasize the, the issue of uh, dieting, the, the proper food that the mother should take. At what time should, because even from the times of pregnancy, because I believe that preparation towards that, but how soon should the mother begin to be very conscious of what she eats and what she shouldn't eat? Okay. Even no, no, the woman I'm, I'm asking, uh, we'll, we'll come to you uh, uh, Dr. Adeyemi, we're in the studio now with uh, Dr. Olawi. Right. Even before getting pregnant, she needs to eat well and okay. eat right. During pregnancy, she needs to and eat well. That, that, that's only standard, standard for every human being. For every eat human well. being. Eat well <laughs> and pregnancy, you eat well. Adequate nutrition or what you call a balanced diet. And the woman should remember that she's not eating for two but she's eating adequate diet. She should eat balanced and adequate diet, good food, right. and water. Mm. Yeah. So that, because if she doesn't eat well, it's going to affect the quality of her milk, like she rightly said. She needs to eat well so that the baby can have quality and adequate milk. Because the milk, the breast milk is said to be the gold standard. And nothing can be equate with the breast milk. And so, and it's adequate for this baby's growth and development. That is if the mother eats very well. So, and we encourage, that's why I say the father has a role to play, because it is believed that he is the one that would provide for the household. So he's the head of the family, he should provide good nutrition for this woman to mm. breastfeed the baby properly. We, we, we have, we have uh, a demonstration here. You have, you have a little baby doll here and so Does on. It baby? It'll, it'll be good for us to understand how, you know, the placements and you demonstrate for young mothers who might be watching on how best, you know, to breastfeed the baby. Okay. To breastfeed the baby, the woman needs to assume a comfortable position. Okay. Position the baby this way, the head of the baby towards the elbow, mm. the arm, and the palm supporting the back and the Botox of the baby. Oh, baby. She needs an armless chair okay. and she needs to support herself. She is not giving the breast to the baby, but she brings the baby up to the breast okay. so that she doesn't have backache. Back and this is the, the breast. So, and when she is breastfeeding, she needs to put the, the nipple, the entire nipple, and part of this place is called the areola in the baby's mouth. Because if the baby suckles only on the nipple, she has a cracked nipple and quickly she wants to stop breastfeeding. And, you know, the problem of breastfeeding, one leads to the other. Once she has a crack, she develops engorgement. Engorgement is that fullness of the breast. She doesn't want to feed the baby. From that one, it will lead to another thing, infection sets in, and the baby is not able to do that. So we encourage her. Positioning and latching is very, very key. To successful breastfeeding so she needs to get it right once a woman gets it right she'll be successful in breastfeeding the baby mm. and you know we are talking about exclusive breastfeeding for the first six months of life without water without any pre lactal feed but do you subscribe to women who prefer to lie down while breastfeeding a woman can assume any comfortable position the most important thing in breastfeeding is attachment latching. and latching she can assume any position. Even a woman can sit down the way I'm sitting, especially for a baby in this, um, all these are free time, we put them in kangaroo mother position. You see some people go around now, places their baby this way. Mm. She can loosen that wrap, 
and breastfeed the baby this way. Once the baby can suckle at the nipple, the baby will be successful in so, breastfeeding. So, so the baby mustn't be, be in the lying position. We have different positions. In the, in this, in we have different positions. The baby can sit with the mother this way. There's another one you call the cradle hold. You can football hold. Even the baby can. Once the baby can suck very well and latch to the nipple very well, they will be successful in breastfeeding. There, there, there is also so any one, comfortable position, okay. a particular one. Speak to us from the window of, um, we, we've seen cases where a mother is breastfeeding the child and sleeps off. And so, well, the baby can suck and sleep whenever she wants to sleep. What are the cautions that mothers should, you know, apply at times like that? Because uh, when you are asleep, you don't know what's, what could happen. Okay. Especially women that are well endowed, when they are breastfeeding their baby, they need to be alert. You don't, we don't encourage them to sleep off. So it's even the baby that should sleep off, and then the mother can also go to sleep. Not the mother sleeping while the baby is sucking at the breast. It can be a little risky, so that the baby will not get choked. So when mothers are breastfeeding, please be awake and be alive to that particular responsibility that you are carrying out around that period. All right. Okay, back to, you know, Dr. Adeyemi now. Of course, the reality for many women uh, is that as much as, uh, you know, they key into this, this, this ideal of um, breastfeeding, of, uh, you know, just breastfeeding your baby for the first six months, exclusive breastfeeding, as, as much as it is, it is a brilliant I idea, but it's, it's not uh, working for some women uh, due to many reasons. Of course, you've spoken in, in that direction. But um, there are options now. We see and hear of milk banks, uh, pasteurized donor human milk, they call it, but simply put milk banks. I, I want to know what you feel about these options, uh, you know, for women who may want to explore them. Okay, so thank you very much. Um, that's a practice that's not yet so common in Nigeria, but it's something that it's needed because we have some women who wish and desire to breastfeed, but for some certain medical conditions, they are just not able to breastfeed. For example, a woman that is probably unconscious even after um, after delivery and has the intention of breastfeeding. So there's actually a place for that and it's um, rightfully so. However, we need to exercise a bit of caution because um, some, there are some infections that can actually be um, transmitted through breast milk. So ideally, this breast milk, the donors of this breast milk are adequately screened and um, emphasis on the word adequately screened to ensure that the breast milk is safe for this baby to take. So yes, if adequately screened, if breast milk is gotten from um, a very healthy donor, then yes, such milk can actually be given to infants of mothers who for one reason or the other cannot breastfeed their children directly. So the onus is on the um, intending beneficiary? Um, no, not the intended beneficiary. So yes, um, wherever this breast milk is donated to, there's an, an organization in charge of that. So they ensure that even before they get donors for this breast milk, they are properly screened. They ensure that the quality of breast milk that is coming out is actually one that is good and will be beneficial to whatever infant is receiving this breast milk. So the beneficiary should ensure that wherever they are getting this breast milk from, they are, they are um, international standards that are being applied, quality is ensured, and even hygiene also is a very, very important in such places where this breast milk are being gotten from. And finally, the storage of this breast milk, because breast milk has to be stored at a particular temperature to ensure that even when you bring it out and thaw, you're getting all the value, all the nutrient value present in that breast milk still at the state that it's supposed to be. All right. Uh, back to the studio, do you want to address that? Because some say that may just be the way to go instead of taking formula. Uh, wh what do you make of these options? I think it's the way to go. And then screening is very, very necessary. And even consent, too, is necessary. Before you give somebody um, another woman breast milk, you need to take consent from the parent of the baby. Mm. Yeah. And storage is very, very important. We can also encourage them to express this milk, you understand? Express the milk 
put it at room temperature, stand it in a bowl of water so that hand does not perch on it, or put it where there's adequate light, we can refrigerate it and bring it out to tour whenever we want to give it to these babies. So we encourage mothers to, you see, we try as much as possible to encourage parents, the mother, to express this milk. There are some of them who say, oh no, because they already made up their mind that this is what they want to do. But they say in the babies fact, will not be well fed. Well, the babies will not be well fed. <laughs> and, in, and in fact, even more than ever now, because of the economic downturn, you find out that this breast milk is just the best for the baby because the mother can eat and help us to produce adequate milk supply to the baby. And that is just enough because it's going to save her from a lot of trouble. That first six months, no diarrhea, no infection in this baby. You understand? Just have your daily bath, put this baby to breast. It doesn't cost you anything. You don't need any, any, any utensils. You don't need to wash. You don't need to buy any extra equipment or anything to breastfeed this baby well. So we're encouraging mothers to please breastfeed your baby. Okay. Uh, Dr. Adeyemi, let me bring you in here. Can you share with us some of the misconceptions people have about breastfeeding or not breastfeeding? Some people have said that uh, if, if the child is not properly breastfed and the formula is used and, you know, and, and all of that, that children growing up will behave like animals and not behave like human beings and so on. I wonder what misconceptions you hear around these issues. Okay, so the most common misconception is among younger mothers these days. So they feel that when they um, breastfeed their child um, exclusively for six months or even breastfeed their child at all, they will end up with saggy breasts. And their breast starts um, <laughs> becoming very saggy. Yeah. That's a very common one because, you know, we are now in a day and age of where everybody is very conscious about their bodies. So we hear that a lot. So we have a different health education message targeted to young mothers. Then there's also the misconception that when you exclusively breastfeed your child, that when it's time for complementary feeds at six months of age, that the child will refuse eating so that you now need to be introducing Absolutely. food to, be, to the yeah. child from like three, four months so that the child will not become a picky eater. That's also a misconception. Then there are also bad practices in some climes of Nigeria where they feel the first milk that comes out is called colostrum. It's yellow in color. So there's a belief that this is very dirty and that this is not mm. good for the child. Meanwhile, the colostrum strong is actually the most important part yes. because it has all the antibodies, most of the antibodies needed to protect these children from developing infections in later stages of life. So there are many misconceptions like that. There are misconceptions um, surrounding even the woman that she feels that if she exclusively breastfeeds her child, that um, is going to affect her weight. Some are concerned about their weight loss. Meanwhile, exclusive breastfeeding actually aids weight loss after pregnancy. So these are just some of the myths and misconceptions surrounding breastfeeding. To support her. Right, right. Yeah, but, but uh, yeah, right. Okay. Be before we come to the studio, in terms of, you know, the, the concerns about, you know, you know, breast getting saggy and children not being able to eat normally, you know, you know, to experiment with food after the first six months of being exclusively breastfed, how do women navigate those concerns? Okay, so the first thing about the saggy boobs is that it's natural. It's law of gravity. What goes up will definitely come down. Mm -hmm. So what we encourage women to do, we have good, great, nursing, supportive bras. Right. So these are, these are bras that you wear that help support even the breast tissue. Because usually when you're breastfeeding, your breasts are fuller. And as I said, what goes up would come down. So gravity would definitely pull this down. But by the time you have great supportive bras and that you are able to be, um, wear firm bras, this would help uh, to reduce the quick effect, to reduce the effect of this um, breast sagging um, at a very early stage. And then for the children also, most children, complementary feeding starts at six months. So definitely there might be some slight sitting challenges in the first few days when you're introducing new food. This is absolutely normal. So what we encourage them to do is to keep trying 
trying different foods. There's no need to give anything other than breast milk in the first six months of life. You just prepare your mind that the first few days when you're introducing your complementary feeds, you need to be a bit patient with this baby that has been used to milk for just six months and then introduce these foods gradually. And with time, babies will pick up and start eating properly. Okay. All right. All right, uh, so, we're against that, uh, but you wanted to give us a section that is very, very, yeah. very key that is affecting yeah. exclusive breastfeeding mm. is that baby must take water. Oh, yes. Mm. This baby mm. is, that's where the problem is. Mm. For example, last year, the exclusive breastfeeding rate is about 29%, and those people giving water, exclusive plus water, is about 40%. So if you had 40 to 20, we are getting to about 69. Mm. So we are telling them that greater percentage of breast milk is water. Mm. So the baby does not need water when they are practicing exclusive breastfeeding. Mm. And when they are introducing complementary feed, uh, feeds, they need to exercise patience with this baby. Because where we have problem is that the mother wants the baby to begin to eat amala today, <laughs> take pandediam tomorrow, take ogi, take cereal, you know, it, at the same time. So we encourage them to introduce one at a time, let the child be stable on that particular one, be used to it and stabilize on it, then introduce another one. Okay. And when we are introducing, the baby cannot suddenly take what an adult is taking. Mm. It has to be, you know, in very soft constituents okay. for the baby. One step at a time. Nice. Yes. All right. Thank you so much, Dr. Olubukala Olawi, a pediatric so care nurse and breastfeeding advocate. We really appreciate you. Thank you so And also much. demonstrating always. this always. always. Every much. year Thank we keep so doing much. this. Thank, Thank you so much for what you do. Please, I Thank you. Yellow just too, they should get involved. Yeah. Right. Our first lady, Her Excellency, Mrs. Olure Mutinobu, she also, we are appealing to her mm. to make this maybe part of our Part of our project. policies, uh, right? Yeah. Good. And uh, Dr. Oluwatoni Adeyemi, thank, so thank you so much for joining us on the program this morning. We really appreciate both of you. Right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Great.